How many of you know you've never been through something alone? Jesus has been with you. And so we know that in every one of these situations, situations we can explain and situations we can't explain, what we know is that he is with us. That was a good place to say amen. Not about several hundred of you missed that opportunity to say amen right there. Just want, want to give you that. So we're continuing just to stand and believe with our brothers and our sisters and our church family. How many of you know your church families? Uh, this is a great church family, amen, right here in Oklahoma City. But our family extends way beyond uh, the boundaries of this city. And, uh, and we, get to, we get to stand in with our family this week. So continue to pray for Bishop uh, this week. I want you to grab your Bibles, and I just want to jump right into the Word of God as quickly as I can because I, I feel like what our assignment is today is just to share some from the Word of God and then respond to the Word of God today. So I want to try and leave time for us to do that in our service today. Uh, we've been in the middle of a series called Awakening. And, uh, and we're asking God, we're leaning into this idea that uh, God awakens us. And so uh, we've been in a passage, a verse of scripture uh, that Bishop began a few weeks ago. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14 is a very familiar verse. And we'll read that as well as another verse this morning. But I want to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes from this subject. Uh, awaken the seekers. Awaken the seekers. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your presence that's been so rich with us, and we pray that we would remain open to your presence that is here right now. We recognize your presence, Jesus. We recognize your desire to say something and to do something in our midst today. So, Lord, I join with my brothers and sisters right here in this auditorium, with my brothers and sisters who are online, and we say together we're opening our hearts for you to do what you want to do in our lives this morning. We ask you to speak to us. Lord, give us courage and faith to respond to you with great, great passion today. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This verse is often quoted, if my people who are called by my name. And I want to draw your attention this morning as we begin to the context of this verse in which uh, King Solomon has just dedicated the temple that he had made great effort to build. It was one of the high points in the whole history of Israel. It was one of the greatest moments of their success. It was... Uh, I mean, on the highlight reel of the vision video, you're going to show Solomon's temple. I mean, it didn't get much better than that in terms of God's blessing, God's favor, how much we've been able to do. And God gives a word to Solomon for this dedication time. And it's an interesting word. It's a little bit different than we might have expected. And what we find in the whole context of the passage is that God isn't quite as taken by the marvelousness of the temple as the people were taken by the marvelous of the temple. Now, and God says, you know, good job, thank you, God's blessed, he's gracious, but then he goes into this bit about explaining to them on this high point. I mean, they just won the Super Bowl, 
and the coach is giving them the post-game speech, and then he starts talking to them about, now let me tell you about what's going to happen in the future and what you need to be worried about because this is wonderful and you're enjoying all my blessings, but if you ever stop, obeying me and listening to my voice and walking with me. And it's almost like you want to say, wait, God, that's the wrong speech for the wrong occasion. But how many of you have found out that in your conversations with God, whenever God has something on his mind, it's hard to get him to change the subject? Anybody relate to that? You, you want to talk to God about uh, the breakthrough you need. You want to talk to God about the immediate need that you have. You want to talk about God keeps wanting to talk about what God wants to talk about. And, and God's, uh, in a holy way, God can be a little stubborn. And so God says, I want to talk to you about what's going to happen. And he says, if you ever stray away from me, then you're going to find yourself in foreign places that are very unfamiliar to you, that don't have anything to do with this feeling of blessing that you're experiencing right now. You're going to be in an unfamiliar place. You're going to be in a place of exile. It's going to be with people who aren't like you. The customs are going to be different. The culture is going to be different. It's going to be unfamiliar. It's going to be disorienting. And, and I just want you to know that that's very possible. And, and it, you didn't have to be real prophetic to realize that God wasn't telling them this because it wasn't going to happen. God was telling them this because he knew that the day was going to come that he was going to have to allow them to be taken out of the place of their familiarity. He was going to have to allow things to come into them, to interrupt them, to disorient them, to mess their world up. Everything they were familiar with, they didn't have anymore. Everything they were comfortable with was taken away from them. And then God says, but if that ever happens to you, just remember that if my people who are called by my name. Will humble. So he gives them the recipe. How many of you know God, God always gives you what you need? If God tells you something's wrong with you, he's not like, you know, this is an, an incurable disease. God's not the kind of physician that comes along and says, hey, you've got this problem, but there's no cure for that. He always gives the prescription. When God judges something, when God corrects something, he always does it with healing in mind. So he says, if this happens... Then remember that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, pray, then I will heal their land. Now, I know that it's really difficult for you to imagine how that could relate to our present circumstances because I know that nobody right now in America feels like that everything that used to be familiar to you is not familiar anymore, that everything that was comfortable for you is not comfortable anymore, and that everything that, and I know that that's hard, but just use your imagination and just imagine that if you were ever in a season like that, that this verse may have something to say to us. And I want to suggest to you that what God was trying to say is that uh, to the people of Israel, he was trying to say, look, if, if you wander from me, you're going to get into a season that's so unfamiliar to you, that's so foreign to you, that you never would have imagined that this could happen to you. Hello, 2020. And God says, it might even get so bad that you're going to feel like you're on the verge of extinction. You're on the verge of extinction. I mean, this is like, we don't even know if anything will ever be. We don't know what. Uh, You've you got your children and your grandchildren. And, and what happened was they ended up in a land called Babylon. And they began to ask questions like, what, how our kids aren't going to grow up in the country that we know and love? Our grandkids aren't going to have the familiar things that we used to have. This is Babylon. This is a different country. This is the country we're supposed to live in. And the word of the Lord comes to them and says, you know what you need to do? You need to recognize that you may prefer Jerusalem over Babylon. But what you've got to understand is that the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So if you plant a tree in Babylon, it'll be a blessed tree. If you build a house in Babylon, it'll be a blessed house. 
If you raise kids in Babylon, they can be blessed kids. If your grandkids grow up in Babylon, they can be blessed kids. Now, the blessing isn't on Jerusalem. The blessing is in God. And as long as you've got God, it doesn't matter where you find yourself. It doesn't matter where you raise your family. You can find the blessing if you can find God. And God says you're going to feel like on your journey that there are times that you may be on the verge of extinction, but every time you think you're threatened by extinction, God says all I'm doing is helping you recover your distinction. I'm going to say that again. Every time you're threatened with extinction, God sees an opportunity for your distinction. Now, let's think about that for a minute because we're talking about the people of God and the people of God are literally identified by their story. And their story begins in a very unfamiliar and difficult place between Pharaoh and his army and the Red Sea. And God says it looks like at the beginning of my people's story that they're on the verge of extinction. Either Pharaoh's going to kill them or they're going to drown in the sea. But God says, I don't see a possibility for extinction here. I see a possibility for distinction. Because what could happen if I open up that sea and let them walk through a sea on dry land? Then for the rest of human history, they'll be known as the people who walk through the sea. They'll be known as the people who have a God who makes dry land appear in the middle of the ocean. They'll be known as the people who defeated Pharaoh, not with a sword and a spear, but they defeated Pharaoh with a God who opens and closes the seas. God says, I'll take what came to make you extinct and I'll use it to make you distinct. I want the church in America to understand that what God's giving us an opportunity to do in this moment is to distinguish ourselves as the people of God. What do you do when the world is falling apart? What do you do when the world is on fire? You stand firm and you say, my God is able. I have a family history. My God takes people through Red Seas and cross Jordan rivers. Walls fall down and gi giants are slain. Those same people got up to a place called Jericho. And the Bible says Jericho was tightly shut up. No one came in and no one went out. Jericho was a walled city. Jericho had iron chariots. Nobody messed with Jericho. Jericho had the military machine. And God says, Joshua, look at Jericho. You think that city could bring you to extinction, but I'm going to make you known as the people who march around walled cities and watch them fall. There was a young shepherd boy in Israel's history who was threatened with extinction by a giant who taunted the armies of Israel 40 days and 40 nights and said, come. And David had something in his heart that said, everybody thinks Goliath is here to bring about our extinction. But I think if somebody would just trust God enough, God will use this story to help us be distinct from all the other people of the world and David became a king who was distinct from all the others because he was willing to stand in an unfamiliar place are you hearing what I'm saying this morning and so they land in Babylon and they begin to distinguish themselves Daniel the book of Daniel the story of Daniel is the story of someone who remembered 2 Chronicles 7 14 because Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody needs to pray to me, worship me, and bow their knee to me. And Daniel said, well, that's all well and good. And I know you, you're the big bad emperor here on this side of the sea. But I, I remember somebody told me that God said, if my people who are called by my name would turn their face toward heaven and pray. So... I know you've got a lion's den, 
I know you've got a fiery furnace, but I remember that I am a part of a people who are distinct in the earth. <laughs> so while everybody else is so afraid of that fiery furnace and everybody else is so afraid of that lion's den, I'm not going to be afraid because I know that, you know, the, the, the three Hebrew boys, I love what they said. They said, we just want you to know that we're not sure whether God's going to deliver us from that fire or not. We understand that we may land in there and we may burn up, but there's one thing we know for sure. We don't know whether he's going to do it, but we darn sure know he's able to do it. I don't know what the outcome of this season of my life is going to be, but I do know this. I have a God who is able to deliver me. I think we need some people who are comfortable saying, I don't know what the outcome of 2020 will be. I, I'm not here to give you a prediction of what the outcome is going to be. But what I am here to do is to tell you that we do have an anchor beyond the veil. <laughs> uh, our souls are not, are not just blowing in the wind. Our souls are anchored to something beyond the veil. And so we got to understand that it's so easy to, what phrases should I choose in this moment? It's so easy to panic and ask what's wrong with the world. But I want to just give you a quote from a man named John Stott who said we should never ask what's wrong with the world. Because that diagnosis has already been given. It doesn't make any sense for Christians to say what's wrong with the world. We know what's wrong with the world. We, we have a book that tells us what's wrong with the world. This is a very, very reliable source here. We understand what's wrong with the world. That diagnosis has already been given. What we should be asking is what's wrong with the salt. We should be asking what's wrong with the light. You see, I want, to, I want to broadcast aloud to the church that the church is a part of Israel, the story of Israel, and we have a long and thorough history of, of bringing what's called a prophetic critique. Yeah. I didn't mean to turn into a rapper there, sorry. <laughs> a prophetic critique. But the way that the prophetic critique works in Israel, in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, is not by prophetic people standing up and pointing their finger at the world. That's not how prophetic critique works. Because judgment begins in the house of God. So all through Israel, the prophets would stand up. And if you read a book like Isaiah, you'll find that Isaiah has 66 chapters. And in those 66 chapters, you can run through verse after verse of Isaiah saying to Israel, here's what God says to you. Here's what's wrong with you. Here's what you need to get right. This is where your house needs to come into order. And then he might take a paragraph or two every now and then and talk about, you know, this nation or that nation. But then he comes back around to Israel because the emphasis of prophetic critique is never to point our finger at the world and say what's wrong with the world the emphasis of prophetic critique is to point our finger at ourselves and say this is what's wrong with us we are his people we haven't humbled ourselves we haven't turned from our wicked ways we haven't sought his face am I doing all right this morning so so when we begin to understand that the call of God for the people of God is to be distinct, to be salt and light, then we need to ask ourselves, what are we distinguished by? You remember a couple of weeks ago, Bishop began this series by preaching on wearing our apron. And so you can write these down if you want. I'll just move quick and quickly through them. But number one, this passage tells us that we're distinguished by our humility. Now, I could just say, amen, close the book, and go home. And if you took that and worked it out in your life, we'd make a lot of progress today. We're distinguished by our humility. Listen, in the world, people progress by arrogance and self-promotion. But in the kingdom, we progress 
by meekness and self-denial. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You want to inherit God's promise for you? Don't get arrogant, aggressive, start running over people. Get meek. Well, that doesn't make sense. I know, I didn't say it, Jesus did. You got to take it up with him. I know that doesn't really work in the American corporate world, but somehow or another, Jesus promises, if you'll take me seriously, I'll make sure you inherit everything that belongs to you. It may be countercultural, it may not make sense, but if you do it my way, resurrection life will attend everything you do. So that you'll be blessed, not because you manipulated, backstabbed, and went around four people to get there, but you'll be blessed because I said I'm going to bless him. You'll be blessed like Joseph was blessed. and You'll be blessed like Daniel was deaf. Not because you're the most educated. Not because you're the most worthy. Not because you politic. Not because your daddy knows somebody. But because the hand of God is on your life. They'll say, how did he get to that position? How did he get to that pay level? How did he get to that blessing? He didn't do it by conniving in the way of the world. He did it because he's a Jesus person. And so we don't progress by arrogance and self-promotion. We're not only distinguished by our humility, but number two, we're distinguished by our prayerfulness. God help us today be distinguished by our prayerfulness. Man, I feel the heart of God on this. If my people... Why does God have to ask his people to pray? Can you hear his heart? It's my people. It's my kids. My children. If my people would just pray. Is that too much to ask? I can just hear God say, is that too much to ask? I mean, I'm not asking you to. I'm just praying. What is prayer? Talking to God. God sounds like a lonely parent. Man, if you just call. Just send me a text message. Let me know how you're doing. I, I, lo- I think about you every day. I, I just want to hear your voice. I, I died on the cross for you. I, I just would like to hear you. I just, man, it would be great if, if my people, if my children would just give me a call. Call him up. Call him up. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus on the main line, but it's dead. Signal. Nobody on the other end. In the kingdom, in the world, we bring change through political power. Y'all hold on to your seats. We're about to encounter turbulence. In the kingdom, we birth transformation through spiritual power. In the world, we enact change by political power. That's the way the world operates. In the kingdom, we don't exert natural political power to get God's will and way. We go into our prayer closet. And we get and we shut the door and we get another source of power. Selah. We're distinguished by our prayerfulness. What distinguishes you from your coworkers? that don't walk with God does your humility distinguish you does your prayerfulness distinguish you and I don't mean by prayerfulness I don't mean your weirdness I don't mean that you pray in the middle of every sentence that you talk to your co-worker with I don't mean that you interject hallelujah glory be to God blessed and highly favored into every other sentence at work 
That's not what I mean by saltiness. That's, that's not what I mean by... I mean that when they get in your presence, they feel like they've been in the presence of something more than you. <laughs> because you have come out of a place that has put an aroma on your life that makes them wonder something is different about that person. Because if I were them, I would be stressed out. But they seem to have a source of peace that I don't know anything about. That's, that's, that's what I mean by distinguished by prayerfulness. And the last thing, and, and we'll finish here and, and focus on here for the rest of the morning, is that we are distinguished by what we seek. We are distinguished by what we seek. So in the world, we seek after temporal things. That's very simple. That's very clear. In the kingdom, we seek after eternal things. So God was saying to the people of Israel, you've got to pray and you've got to seek my face. He said, you're going to get to a place where you don't understand how you got there. You don't understand what's going on. And he said, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a good question for you when you get there. Is just ask yourself, what have you been seeking? Yeah. If you're at a place in life and you don't understand how you got there, then ask yourself the question, what have I been seeking? Yeah. Because what you're seeking, what you've been seeking has determined where you've arrived. If you've been seeking the face of God, then you will have arrived in the presence of God. But if you've been seeking a bunch of stuff that isn't even going to last through next year, let alone through eternity, then you may have found yourself at a place you don't like, but it's a direct result of what you've been seeking. Am I doing okay? How did we get to this place? We got to this place because we were seeking the wrong things. We were seeking the wrong things. There's a, a man who lived in the 19th century named Soren Kierkegaard, and he made some comments uh, in a book called An Attack on Christendom. And I don't have time to unpack all of that, but I think the statements will make sense. But where uh, Soren Kierkegaard was serving and writing, the church was in 19th century Dutch society, and it had uh, become pervaded with a cultural Christianity. And I know this is really going to be hard for you to connect to and understand and imagine, but this is what it was like for him. Is that everybody in his country at that time used Christian language. It was a Christian nation, but not very many people were real serious about following Jesus. And so Soren Kierkegaard got real disturbed on his inside about this. And he wrote some books. And, and uh, they're kind of fiery books. He, he didn't really hold back any punches. And uh, so this is what he said. And, and let's just try to use our imagination and just see if maybe this could have any sort of, I don't know, just perhaps that there's a slight possibility that it may have. I know it was 19th century Dutch society, and that's not where we live and when we live now, but if we ever found ourselves in a place where there was lots of cultural Christianity, where people used Christian language and assumed that they were Christians, but it was just a cultural Christianity, it wasn't a real serious following of Jesus, then, then he may have something to say to us. He said, we have created admirers of Jesus instead of followers of Jesus. We have people who appreciate Jesus. They just don't obey Jesus. You know, and now I'm going to just drop right down here into the 21st century America. Is that okay? It's one thing, if you didn't catch my sarcasm, it's okay. It's one thing to trust Jesus as my Savior. It's another thing to take seriously what Jesus says about how I'm to live my life. And with all due respect, I'm just going to push on this idea that we trust Jesus as our Savior and then we create a false notion that everything is okay. Because in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wraps the Sermon on the Mount up. He concludes his sermon, which I'm trying to do with mine. He concludes his sermon by saying, watch this. This is what he does not say. He does not say... If you trust in me and pray a prayer of salvation, then you will be like a man who built his house on the rock, and when the storms comes, your house will stand. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus did not say, if you trust in me as your personal Savior and pray a prayer, then your house will stand. This is what Jesus said. He said, 
if anyone hears these sayings of mine and does them. I, I'm just reading the Bible. If anyone hears these teachings of mine and takes me serious, if anybody recognizes that I really am king and lord, and that even when it doesn't make sense, you still live your life based on the teachings of Jesus, then that guy right there will be like a man who built his house on a rock. And when the storms come, his house will stand. So I want to suggest to you that if you got to Jesus by trusting him as your personal savior and by praying a prayer, fantastic. I'm glad you got to Jesus that way. But the real key to your life is not whether you felt something in a service and came to an altar and prayed a prayer. The real key to your life is whether you're saying every day, I'm going to take him serious. I'm going to live my life based on the teachings of Jesus, based on the example of Jesus. I'm going to become his disciple. I don't want to just admire Jesus. Everybody admires Jesus. Everybody thinks Jesus was wonderful. I think Jesus was wonderful. Do you think Jesus was wonderful? Put an atheist on CNN, and they will tell you that apparently Jesus was a wonderful man. Everybody admires Jesus. Admiring Jesus won't get you anywhere. But giving your life to Jesus will get you somewhere. Jesus is not looking at admirers. He didn't walk through the Gospels and look at people and say, would you admire me? Come on. He didn't say, would you appreciate me? Come on. Take authority over that iPad. <laughs> the devil's fighting my iPad right now. Trust in Jesus means to take him seriously. It means every day. Can I make this daily? Can we get out of conceptual theory, theory every day? Do you spend time with Jesus? Lord, what do I got going on today? What do you think about it? How should I respond to that? What should I do about this? Lord, is my attitude okay in this area, in this relationship? <clears throat> Soren Kierkegaard challenged his society to recognize that you don't follow Jesus by fighting for your rights. You follow Jesus by laying down your life. I'm just going to move on right past that before somebody throws a rock at me. Amen. Here's the point I'm trying to make as simply as I can. It's possible to trust Jesus for my salvation and yet my life be about seeking all sorts of things other than his face. I'm going to say that one more time. It's possible to trust Jesus for my salvation, but my life is still about seeking all kinds of things other than his face. See, God didn't tell the people in Israel, you're going to forget about me. He didn't say, you're going to not know who I am. He just said, you're just going to have found yourself to have started seeking a whole bunch of stuff, and I only wanted you to seek one thing. And so Jesus comes as the fulfillment of this whole idea when he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, God just wants to know what you're seeking first. And then if you think that God's trying to take stuff away from you, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his justice, and all these other things will be added unto you. The problem is the stuff that God wants to add to my life, I keep making the Lord of my life. But God doesn't want to make it uh, the Lord of my life. He wants to make it an addition to my life. He wants to be the Lord of my life. And he actually wants to be in charge of what gets added to my life. And what I'll find out is that if I make him the Lord of my life, he wants to be better to me than I would have been to myself. But every time I get in his way and start doing his job and trying to add things to my life and seek after all sorts of things that he hadn't called me to seek after, but if I'll ever come back to the place of seeking his face first then he says now I can make your life what I want it to be we're going to throw a bunch of scriptures on the screen this morning and I'm going to ask the worship team just to get ready uh, to come 
And I want to give you an opportunity for whatever this means in just a moment. And we're going to take an opportunity as a church. On Friday night, we had a prayer meeting. We had a wonderful time. I understand everybody couldn't, couldn't be there for that. But you didn't know it this morning, but you came to another prayer meeting. Yes. You're going to get an opportunity to pray, to seek God's face, to turn from any wicked ways in your life. And you know what I believe? I believe you're going to find, I'm going to show you right now in the scripture, you're going to find that the minute you do that, you're going to find Jesus ready and waiting. You see, some of you haven't been seeking God's face because you're concerned about God's disposition towards you. But I want to dispel that for you right now with the word of God. Can I do that? Psalm 105 and verse number 3 says, Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Man, I, I, have you ever met people in church and every time they told you they were seeking the Lord, they looked like they were depressed and about to just fall apart and the most miserable person? I just want to make sure they know this first. The Bible says when you seek the Lord, it causes you to rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. The message translation says, honor his holy name with hallelujahs, you who seek God. Live a happy life. How can we live a happy life? Because our happiness is not dependent on how well 2020 is going. Our happiness is dependent on the fact that we're seeking God's face. Man, I feel like I'm preaching this morning. Keep your eyes open for God. Watch for His works. Be alert for signs of His presence. We were in prayer before service this morning, and Pastor Kathy just began to share her heart, and this verse was just leaping inside of me. Keep your eyes open for God. Yes. Yes. Amen. Be alert for signs of His presence. Watch for His voice, for His works. Listen to what people who seek God look like. Psalm 34 and verse number 5. They looked to Him, and they were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. Do you know when you seek God's face, you'll find yourself in the presence of God and your face will not be ashamed? That's right. Isn't that a, that's an amazing thing. Because I don't know about you, but there's some stuff in my life right now I'm not really uh, excited about just bearing it to God. Uh -huh. But apparently, if I'll get in the presence of God, no matter what's going on in my life, my face won't be ashamed. Because I'll find that God says, I've just been waiting on you to get in here so I can heal you, I can restore you, I can forgive you. How many of you know that prodigal son was so nervous about what daddy's reaction was going to be? He thought, I'm going to knock on the door, I'm going to have to look all the way into his bedroom, and when I find him, he's going to be so mad at me. But when the Bible says, when he saw him a great distance off, he said, I'm not even going to wait for you to get at home. The Bible says the father ran out looking for his brother. I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you to come back home. I've been waiting for you to return to my presence. In the light, in the light of the king's face, there's life and his favor is like a cloud of spring rain. Numbers chapter 6, we say this often at the gate church, the Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now I'm going to jump to Jesus and we're going to pray. The Lord make his countenance lift upon you and give you peace. What did Jesus say to his disciples when he rose from the dead? What was the first word out of his mouth? Peace. What did Jesus tell his disciples when he was on his way to the cross? He said, my peace I give to you. Jesus says, how's life working, how's life working for you with your peace? How, how's that working out for you with your peace? I got a deal for you, Jesus says. I want to give you my peace. I, I want that to sink in. Jesus is saying to you, he wants to give you his peace. He got some pretty good peace. Come on, come on. He's doing all right. Yes, he does. Yes, he I ain't does. never seen Jesus stressed out about nothing. And he said, I want to give that to you. I want to give that to you. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, watch this. All through the Old Testament, we get glimpses of God. And Paul's drawn on Moses in this verse. I don't have time to unpack it this morning. 
and I'm getting nerdy on you. We have a good time. But he's drawn on Moses all day long. It is God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. One chapter before, Paul's talking about Moses being veiled. And now we with unveiled faces come into the glory of God. And we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. So Paul's got Moses in mind. And what God told Moses was, you can see my backside, Moses, but you can't see my face. God, Moses says, show me your glory, God. And, Paul, and God said, I can't do that because if you see my face, you won't be able to live. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus says, now the time has come not for you to be content just to see what God did or see some inkling of the goodness of God. But God has taken the veil off in Jesus. And God has come in Jesus to say, this is what God is like. This is the fullness of God's glory. This is the fullness of God's revelation. This is the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So we are new covenant people who we don't have to seek and grovel after God hoping that he'll respond to us. No, no, no. Jesus has answered all of those questions. He's gone beyond the veil. He's opened up a new and living way so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus and we can behold the face of God, the glory of God, the beauty of God. We have an open door invitation into God God's presence because of Jesus. And if we're going to be distinguished as the people of God, then we are going to have to change what we've been seeking. Now, the last thing I want to say to you as we get ready to close, come on, Ashley, if you guys are ready. Somebody play the keyboard. That helped the preacher stop. That's church. That's church 101 right there. That's just church 101. Something about that keyboard. <laughs> Listen. Listen, I was, this morning, I had written my notes, I was done, ready. This morning, the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me about this moment. He said, there's people watching online, there's people in the sanctuary, and they need to hear this. Listen to this phrase. Out of darkness. God has shown forth his light to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You know what that means? You know what 2 Corinthians 7, 14 is when you find yourself in a place of darkness, then just seek after God's face. Just come looking for God. And Paul says what God does in Genesis 1, he keeps on doing over and over and over again. And so the trick of the enemy is to get me to believe that because I'm in a place of darkness, I can't get to God. Y'all, y'all got to get this. I have believed that so many times in my life. Because I failed. Because I messed up. Because I know I blew it. Because I know I haven't handled this right. Because I know that I deserve to be distant from God. God does. I know it. So it withholds me. It restrains me. But Paul says, out of darkness, God will shine light. God will show up right in the middle of your unfamiliar place. You know what? You may not have prayed in nine months. But if you just say, Jesus, then out of darkness, light will shine into your heart. Out of darkness, God will show up in your life. I'm telling you, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. All you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry, and I'm ready to come back. God, I want to seek your face. God, I want to turn from my wicked ways. God, I humble myself. God, I call on your name. You don't have to, you don't need a lot of words. You don't need a great eloquent prayer. All you need is a heart that says, God, I just want you. And whatever I've been seeking, instead of seeking you, God, I want to make that change today. I'll probably mess it up tomorrow, God, but I'll be back, and you can help me again. And if I mess it up next week, I'll be back, and you can help me again. Because I know that no matter how many times I put things over you, if I'll just return and say, God, help me to seek you first. Help me to seek your face. Help me to make you the priority of my life. Then God says, that's all I need. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. So come on, would you stand to your feet? all over the building.
Would you just raise your hands right now? Just raise those holy hands. Maybe you don't feel like you can do that. Maybe you don't feel worthy this morning. But I want you to get bold and believe the word of the Lord this morning. I want you, no matter where you're at in your life, no matter how much darkness is surrounding you, come on, Gate Church. I want us to be a people who are distinguished because we seek God's face with all of our heart. So before Ashley sings and before I pray, would you just let something begin to come up out of your mouth right now? saying, Lord, I love you. I thank you today. I turn to you. I worship you. Lord, I move in your direction. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. Yes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see you. I want to see you high. To see you high and lift, shining in the light of the glory. Come on, let him hear that from your heart. Lord, more than anything, Lord, we want to see you. pour out here. your power as we sing holy, to see you high. your face. So as we sing and we worship, I want you to create an altar right now somewhere and begin to call upon the name of the Lord. We won't dismiss this service. Whenever you need to go, you're free to go. But we're going to be a people at the gate church who seek God's face. We're going to be a people at the gate church who call upon God's name. If you're joining us online, then right now, wherever you are, I want you to make an altar. I want you to get on your knees at your couch. I want you to get on your face, walk into a different room, begin to seek God's face, and call upon his name as we worship the living God. Come on, let's lift our voices. I want to see you. Yes, we do. Say yes, we do. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 